Hey guys, Kenna here. And today we're gonna to be talking about energy efficiency as we go ahead and begin our new unit on renewable energy. So what are our essential questions for today? So question number one, what is energy efficiency? If we're gonna talk about it, we probably should know what it is. Number two, why is improving energy efficiency and reducing energy waste an important energy goal? Number three, how can we improve energy efficiency in industry and utility? Number four, what is a smart grid? You may have heard that term before. But what does that mean to have a smart grid? And number five, how can we design buildings that save energy and money? Let's start by just looking at energy efficiency itself. So, why is energy efficiency an important energy resource? Well, improvements in energy efficiency could save at least a third of the energy used in the world and up to 43% of the energy used in the United States. We have a variety of technologies for sharply increasing the energy efficiency of industrial operations, motor vehicles, appliances, and buildings. So as I mentioned, if we're gonna talk about energy efficiency, we probably should know what it is. So, Essentially, energy efficiency is how much useful work we get from each unit of energy. Remember the second law of thermodynamics. We're always going to have some inefficiency. There's going to be some lost energy in terms of heat in particular, because no energy using device operates at 100% efficiency. So what are the advantages to reducing energy waste? One, this is usually the cheapest way to provide more energy rather than finding another resource somewhere else. Two, this helps to reduce pollution and degradation. Three, we're gonna slow atmospheric warming because we're not putting more uh, material into the atmosphere to go ahead and cause climate change. And if we get more efficient, we may be able to get to a point where we actually can put less of that and it can buy us more time to move towards more renewable sources. And four, it increases economic and national security because we can do that more internally. We don't have to rely as much on other countries. So we have to recognize that we use energy inefficiently. We just do. And in our daily activities, there are plenty of things that we do that waste energy. We live or work in buildings with really poor heating and cooling. You know, I, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself. My house is not the best insulated. It's an older house and probably should do something to go ahead and fix the, the insulation. So we have less need for heat, less need for cooling. Uh, commuting to work alone. Again, before COVID, um, I usually drive to work on, on, on my own, um, not the most efficient. And, you know, talk, we've talked about getting an electric car, but as of right now, um, I still drive a automobile to, car, to work by myself. Number three, driving vehicles that use gas inefficiently. I, my, my vehicle is not horrible, but it does have a bigger engine in it. And so that's definitely using more gas than it could. Uh, although, you know, it's something we're exploring to try and see if we can do better. Uh, four widely used devices that waste energy, incandescent light bulbs. We've started switching out most of ours. We use either compact fluorescent or LEDs. The LED I have right here at my desk is, has been great. It took me a while to find a color that I felt comfortable with, but I really like the incandescent at my desk here. Uh, not incandescent, but my LED light here. Motor vehicles with an internal combustion engine. Uh, this is almost everyone. And in, then industrial motors. Um, you can't control the industrial motor, but yeah, like I mentioned, we are starting to look at switching to an electric for our next vehicle. Um, to give you a sense of how much waste we're talking about, I think it's, it's beneficial to look at a diagram. This may not be the easiest diagram to look at, but I thought it was valuable. It illustrates the flow of commercial energy through the United States economy. Only about 16% of the country's high quality energy actually ends up performing useful tasks, which if you think about it, we have about 40, 84% then, 84% that is lost. Okay, either through waste or unavoidable energy loss. So that's crazy. Um, so if we think about that, roughly 84% of all commercial energy used in the US is wasted. And about 41% of this is, uh, we're gonna lose. It's unavoidable as low quality waste heat is lost to the environment. Remember the second law of thermodynamics. 
but the other 43% is mainly lost just due to inefficiency of our industrial motors, our motor vehicles, power plants, numerous other energy consuming devices. If we can cut that 43% out, imagine how much extra energy we would have and the crisis that we're kind of in right now could help bridge the gap as we start transitioning to more renewable energy sources. Um, improving energy efficiency is especially important in the areas of industry and transportation, which are the two top energy consumers in the US economy. Data centers, for example, are one of the worst offenders. These facilities house computer servers that process all online information, uh, like, like data on social media websites, for example, and provide cloud-based data storage for users. Well, most data centers are incredibly energy inefficient. They typically use only about 10% of the electrical energy they consume. The other 90% is lost as heat. And most of these run for 24 hours a day at their maximum capacities, regardless of demand for information. And they require a large amount of energy for cooling and keeping their servers from overheating. So there may be some ways where we can improve this. So one of those uh, is to save energy by using cogeneration. Uh, this was a new term to me too. Um, but cogeneration essentially produces two useful forms of energy from the same fuel source. Uh, the steam can be used for generating electricity in a power or industrial plant and can be captured to use again to heat the plant or other nearby buildings instead of being released into the environment. The energy efficiency of these types of systems has been identified at about 60 to 80 percent compared to the 25 to 35 percent for coal powered and nuclear plants. Denmark uses cogeneration to produce 53% of its electricity, which is more than any other country in the world. In comparison, the US uh, uses cogeneration to produce only about 12% of its electricity. Industries can also save money by using more energy efficient variable speed electric motors. Uh, they're designed to run at minimum speed needed for every job. In contrast, standard models, motors will run at full speed with their output throttles to match the task. This is somewhat like using one foot to push the gas pedal to the floorboard of your car and putting your other foot on the brake to control its speed. Um, so if we're constantly flooring it and then using the brake to kind of get it down to speed, that's much less efficient than using a variable speed electric motor, which only runs at the speed that is needed. Uh, also, we can start looking at recycling materials. Recycling materials such as steel and other metals can help industry to save energy and money. Recycling can also reduce negative environmental impacts. For example, um, producing steel from recycled scrap iron uses 75% less high quality energy than producing steel from virgin ore and emits 40% less in terms of our hazardous greenhouse gases. Uh, steel is the world's most recycled material. That's a great way to go ahead and do it. Industries can also improve energy efficiency by making simple changes to the workplace. Switch your incandescent bulbs to LED lighting. You can adjust your thermostat uh, temperatures, limit air conditioner use, install smart meters to monitor energy use. Workers can shut off computers, printers, and non-essential lights at the end of the workday. Uh, leaving them on uses energy. A growing number of major corporations are starting to save money by improving their energy efficiency. Uh, between 1990 and 2014, Dow Chemical Company, which operates 165 manufacturing plants in 37 countries, saved 27 billion, yeah, you heard that right, with a B billion dollars by carrying out a comprehensive program to improve its energy efficiency. The Ford Motor Company, saves $1 billion a year simply by turning off computers that are not in use. So there are ways we can be more efficient with the energy that we do use. We can also start looking at creating a smarter electrical grid to save energy and money. Uh, the current electrical grid system is incredibly outdated and wasteful. It's incredibly inefficient. If we switch to a smart grid, 
um, by being able to use ultra high voltage, super efficient transmission lines and controlling it digitally, we're able to shift energy to where it is needed most so that we're not uh, losing energy or ending up with it in some place that's not needed. This responds to local changes in the demand and supply. So if one area is making more energy, it can shift that energy to an area that needs more energy. This makes it much easier to buy renewable energy because you can get it from where it's being made. But this requires us to be smart in how we design our electrical grid. This next diagram shows how a smart grid would efficiently connect homes and businesses to energy resources. Okay. And it'll save consumers like you and me money as well. A smart grid is going to allow two-way communication between us and the utility providers to increase the efficiency of our energy usage. By putting smart meters in houses, uh, it'll help us to track how much electricity we're using, when we use it, and what it's costing us essentially in real time. We can do this uh, we can use this information to limit electricity use during times when the rates are higher. And according to the Department of Energy, building such a grid would cost a lot, but it would pay for itself. So estimates are that it would cost about $800 billion over the next 20 years. I know that's a ton, but estimates also suggest that it will save the US economy about $2 trillion during that period. So. If you think about it, in the time it's being built, it will eventually, it will actually be paying for itself. So it will already be saving us money by the time it's completed. And think about that, that, that smart shifting of energy from where it's needed to where it's produced, uh, you know, from where it's produced to where it's needed, um, can prevent power outages. And power outages are not just inconvenient, but they're expensive. The U.S. Department of Energy has calculated that the average cost for one hour of power interruption to various industries is about as follows. One hour of loss to cellular communications, and that's to about $41,000. A one hour of loss of power for telephone ticket sales, that's about $72,000 lost. Airline reservations, about $90,000 lost. Credit card operations, <clears throat> mind blown, right? you are losing about $2.58 million for one hour of power outages. Stock market, right? Ooh, you might be too young to really be investing in this, but the stock trading loses about $6.48 million in the single hour of power outage. So we have to think about how much we would benefit from a smart grid. And I know it's expensive. And in the short, immediate term, there may be increases in costs, but over the long term, there will be huge savings. And so we've got to think about it that way. All right, let's move on to transportation. Um, we can improve energy efficiency and save money in transportation as well. Um, we need to think about how we pay for gas right now, because we're not likely to move to fuel efficient vehicles because they're not that cost friendly affordability wise right when we start thinking about affordability it's still cheaper to buy that and even if a government pushes for more fuel efficient vehicles people are not likely to buy them this is especially true when gas prices go down right consumers don't realize that gasoline costs much more than the price they pay at the pump Okay. There are a number of hidden costs that get passed on to consumers through taxes and various other places, um, but that all gets turned back in terms of government subsidies to make the fuel costs look really cheap at the pump. Hidden prices of gasoline, we should be paying $12 a gallon. That's what we should be paying. And you think people complain at $3 a gallon, right? $4 a gallon. That's way too expensive. Highway robbery. No, no. If we didn't use our taxes to actually pay down the cost of fuel at the pump because of subsidies, um, your gas would be running at about $12 a gallon. Car manufacturers and oil companies lobby very heavily to prevent laws to keep the taxes where they are so that the cost of fuel at the pump remains low. 
because that's how they make their money, right? Um, so this is one of the problems we're not seeing is that the, these costs do not include costs related to pollution control, cleanup, higher medical bills, health insurance premiums. All of these things are not included in what you pay at the pump. The International Center for Technology Assessment estimates the hidden cost of gasoline for the U.S. consumer is about $3.18 per liter, okay? That's about $12 per gallon. If people were more aware of these costs, you might purchase things differently. If you realize that that's kind of what it would actually cost. Uh, one way to include more of this is to market the gasoline through higher gas taxes. Um, it would implement full cost pricing that we've been talking about all year to make it more sustainable. However, higher gas taxes are not politically favorable in the US, so it's not likely to happen. Okay. Um, then they start seeing a switch to payroll, income taxes, these types of things instead. This, in theory, will offset any financial burden for consumers, but eventually it gets passed on to you one way or the other. It's just where they name it uh, kind of disguises where that money is coming from and where it's going to. According to the Department of Energy study, replacing most of the current U.S. vehicle fleet with plug-in hybrid vehicles over three decades would cut U.S. oil consumption by 70 to 90 percent. In addition, such a move would eliminate the need for costly oil imports and save consumers money and reduce emissions by 27 percent. If batteries in the hybrid cars were recharged mostly by electricity produced using renewable energy, wind turbines, solar cells, hydroelectric power here in the Northwest, we could drop US emissions by 80 to 90%. This would reduce projected climate change and save thousands of lives by reducing air pollution from motor vehicles and coal burning power plants. And these cars are on the way, okay? Um, we are developing more super efficient and ultralight cars. We already see gasoline electric hybrids out there and plug-in hybrids. Uh, we even are seeing more fuel efficient, energy efficient diesel cars. And they're still working on developing a hydrogen fuel cell. This is what uses hydrogen as fuel to produce electricity when it reacts with the gases in the atmosphere and emits a harmless water vapor. Um, still a very in, in the works technology, but it's something that could potentially be there. I know for me, I'm definitely looking, struggling with it and thinking about looking for an electric car. Um, one of the ones that I'm, I'm kind of holding out for, I've been a big Subaru fan for a long time. And uh, the Solterra is coming out at the end of 2022. And so I think I'm gonna look into getting that one. Uh, my car won't be super old. I can hopefully get a good trade in for it and uh, not have a big monthly payment and have an electric car. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. So it's not just industry, it's not just vehicles, but we can start looking at our buildings as well. Building construction and operation accounts for about one third of the world's resource consumption and about 25 to 40% of its energy use. It also contributes about 30 to 40% of all emissions and 30 to 40% of all solid wastes. This makes the building industry more, if we can make the building industry more sustainable over the next few decades, um, we're gonna have to be more efficient using more renewable energy resources, reusing and recycling materials, uh, reducing pollution and waste. And some examples of more energy efficient designs include the things here. Uh, the first is the green architecture. Green architecture really focuses on building designs that are energy efficient. Um, our science building actually is a movement kind of in that direction. You can look at things like LEED certification that you'll see down there at the bottom. Um, in fact, it can even help move towards what we would call a net zero uh, uh, footprint. Uh, net zero, if you're not familiar with it, is the idea that a building produces enough renewable energy on site to meet its energy needs over the course of the year. Um, a really cool potential concept, but uh, something that's 
not always easy and requires a lot of upfront costs to make happen. Okay. Um, so what else can we start looking at? When we start looking at this, we can start thinking about having um, green roofs, right? Um, green roofs are really cool technology. These living roofs with specially designed soil and vegetation, you're seeing them more and more. Uh, I took the family up to Seattle not too long ago, and there's more and more of these green roofs kind of popping up. They have these little rooftop gardens where people get an out, out, cool outdoor experience. At the same time, you're making uh, a much cleaner environment. There's cooler temperatures in the city. You're seeing more uh, gas exchange to produce more oxygen. And, you know, when we start looking at things like super insulation, and I'm, I'm, I'm yet to see this really in big cities, but if we develop really good insulation systems, you don't have a whole lot of need for heating system or a cooling system in a building. It stays pretty constant temperature, and so that's kind of cool. And so the U.S. Green Building Council's leadership in energy and environmental design, uh, LEED, gives certifications to these types of green buildings. And so you'll see out by our front office, we actually have a LEED certification. And so um, you can be proud that our science building, our office is LEED certified. Okay. Uh, this picture I thought was cool. This actually is showing you Chicago's City Hall. And this is the roof. You can see the green spaces up on the roof. This is a, a genius way to go ahead and go about helping to reduce the heat in cities, the, what's called the heat island effect. Well, we won't talk a lot about it here, but uh, and, and all those different benefits that we talked about before. We can also save money and earn and energy in existing buildings. The biggest thing we can do is conduct an energy audit and you can do this for your house. Insulate and plug leaks, use energy efficient windows, stop uh, other heating and cooling losses. You know, don't run the heater or the air conditioner when you're not there. Heat houses more efficiently, use energy efficient appliances, use energy efficient lighting, use motion sensors to turn lights on and off. All of these are ways that you can help reduce your energy consumption in your house. And it happens in a lot of different places. Um, you could save energy and money by taking all these types of steps to reduce the heat and cooling loss in your home. This diagram here shows you everything from the attic to the bathroom, kitchen, basement, outside, and other rooms. So you might pause the video here, take a look at what steps you could take to help save energy in your home. Okay. All right, guys, that's what I've got for you. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.